right, hello, my name is Sean Duroy. I'm uh, with Applied Blockchain. We're a bespoke development agency focused on the Web3 space. So we were founded in 2015. We worked very closely with the Algorand Foundation and we've also been building our own products and things. Since, since we were founded, we've deployed probably upwards of 100 different blockchain applications to date. Uh, today, I wanted to kind of take you through common DeFi mistakes and common Web3 mistakes we see pretty much every client making and a lot of this time, especially when they're making the jump from a, a Web 2 world into a Web 3 world. So without further ado, I'll go into some of these. Uh, so first one here is I want to port this Web 2 idea to Web 3. And what this basically comes down to is kind of like a, uh, we've got a Web 2 idea and platform, we've got a Web 2 audience, but we want to do this token play to pay for the whole thing. And I won't go into the security side right now, but Every time we talk to clients about this who want to bring this new protocol to life, we start delving into what benefits do you actually want to get from the blockchain. So a lot of the time we talk transparency, immutability, security, it can be verified, it's no tamper-proof, censorship resistance. But when you actually start boiling down to the what value do you actually want to get, you get to the how and whys, you invariably get these misconceptions of things. One of the things that we commonly see this with is, let's say, uh, carbon tokens. Like, carbon technologies is working on some fantastic things, but a lot of people, when they come at the carbon credit thing, especially from a voluntary standpoint, there's this idea that there's, there's all this double and triple exposure where people are reselling the same tokens constantly. And they think that just by minting this token and putting it on the blockchain, it inherently solves this problem. And it does not. It's actually the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the solution. So if you can't justify the whys and the hows, a lot of time it indicates a lack of understanding of the value that you're gonna get from the DeFi world on it. The other thing we kind of see all the time is platforms underestimating user adoption on things. When they're coming from a Web2 world and they wanna connect up that Web2 audience for it, there's still significant amounts of hurdles that people need to overcome. I was reading a UX report this week. It said the average wallet takes 10 to 15 steps to set up. Now, although this is really intuitive for a lot of us in this audience, when you start talking private keys, seed phrases, and storing all of this, a lot of people get intimidated, overwhelmed, and walk away, and it's one of the hurdles that are coming. And we often kind of see uh, people looking at this, and it's, it raises a lot of concerns for how they're going to adopt. And, and it just winds up hamstringing a lot of products. So I think there's a significant uh, educational piece that needs to go with uh, bringing the Web2 audience on board into a Web3 world. So the next one, and this is very basic, right, is the custodial versus non-custodial wallets. But honestly, this comes up in every single Web2 to Web3 uh, uh, platform build that we see. You know, you explain to people what a private key is, you explain a custodial solution, storing those private keys and the ramifications that come with that. You explain hackers take that, compromise that key store, you now have access to everybody's contents. Everybody at this point is like, okay, great, we're going non-custodial. Invariably, the next question that always comes up is what happens when that user or that brand loses their keys? Well, you've lost the contents of the wallet and that opens up a whole can of worms. And we see a lot of people, a lot of our clients actually start going down the wrong path with this immediately. They start bearing the, sh the burden of responsibility uh, for third parties that they shouldn't actually bear. A lot of the times we'll see people uh, think that that's a barrier to adoption. So they'll start to say, well, we'll build up our own wallet. And what happens in those situations is you're focused on building a wallet and a protocol. And like my colleague Andy says, you get this Venn diagram that comes together of two worlds. And what winds up happening is your development team achieves just a tiny little sliver of what they intend to do. Your costs go through the roofs, your timings increase exponentially, and it's hard to compete with your competitors. We also see a lot of people talk about brands and onboarding them and how that's gonna bear a burden to that. And what winds up happening there is like, honestly, if you look at a brand, they already manage a lot of IP, they already manage security risks. There's no reason they can't keep their, their seed phrase is safe. There's no reason that we have to bear that burden of responsibility. So like we kind of say, you know, be careful, focus on what it is, you, what value proposition you're driving at and develop your platform. The next one that we commonly see, the big mistake here is I need my own private layer one. This happens tons with uh, industry consortiums that come together and it's usually born out of a mistake. The people usually think having their own private layer one 
you know, it's for security reasons. We want privacy. But the reality of the situation is cryptography tools have come a long way. That's one of the central things of the foundation of Algorand, the platform of that. Sylvia McCallie is one of the world leading cryptographers. Two thirds of all cryptographers globally are employed by the Algorand Foundation. There's a lot of tools that we actually can use to solve this. And essentially you get much better results uh, if you just use a standard database in this situation than you do on a blockchain. You undermine, by centralizing a, a blockchain, you completely undermine all of its benefits to the user and miss out on the rest of the ecosystem. You cut yourself off from all of the equity or liquidity and so forth. And this is a platform that we built uh, called Silent Data. Uh, basically what we use is a secured hardware enclave. We can connect up to any Web2 HTTPS uh, web service, configure a series of checks, make those checks in a secure hardware enclave, and then mint an attestation online so that a Web3 smart contract can essentially make an informed decision on the back of that. So we're building this out to be like a suite of uh, DeFi, pro uh, basically a suite of tools that DeFi protocols can use to bring, bridge the web two to the web three, and you get much better security and, and still get all of the benefits of being on the central ecosystem. And the last one that comes up all the time, and this one kind of blows my mind a lot, is uh, A, this isn't legal advice, but I've sat on the, I've sat on the phone with uh, securities lawyers numerous times, and no two, no two lawyers who can actually agree on, on, the, on the regulations, especially in each jurisdiction, there's very fuzzy regulations around this. Some places are improving on that, but still, we've got a long ways to go off of that. So one of the things that we commonly hear people do is when they're trying to bridge that Web 2 to Web 3 world, they're doing the token raise to play, pay for that, and it's blatantly a security. And so I've heard people call it reward schemes, incentive bonuses, and all these different things, and it doesn't really matter what you call it. Right now, with the SEC and all of the different regulators that are coming on board and paying a lot of scrutiny to this space, it's actually it's a fraught with danger, especially in the last little while. Two trillion has been wiped out in retail and investor value in the crypto industry. To think that we're not going to have governments delving into that, looking at that, formulating regulations is a bit naive. So that's pretty much the end for me. So we're silent date. Uh, we're applied blockchain. So check us out at appliedblockchain.com. We have silentdata.com, we're building up a, a tally sticks for invoice financing, and we actually are launching London Bridge, which is a secure bridge from Algorand to Ethereum to transfer digital assets through a secured hardware enclave. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation.